For more than a century, Portland's been keeping its form of government weird. Portland's government was always odd, but now it's an outlier. No large city has a government like Portland. Eight times in the past century, voters have had the chance to ditch Portland's commission form of government. Eight times they said no. Could the ninth time be different? I'm Andrew Thien, and this is Beat Check with the Oregonian. Up next, Portland City Hall reporter Shane Dixon-Cavanaugh. We went deep into the charter reform effort, what it would mean for voters, some of the recommendations on the table, and much more. Here's our conversation. Shane Dixon-Cavanaugh, thanks for coming back on the show. Andrew Thien, it is always a pleasure to be on your show. <laughs> I appreciate that. So Shane, most people probably don't give a ton of thought to Portland's form of government on a daily basis, but this is a long simmering dispute over what to do with <laughs> the government uh, here in Portland. So to set the table for us, why are we re-examining this, this issue once again? Well, this fall, voters in Portland are going to have the opportunity to decide whether or not they want to radically reimagine not only Portland's odd, arguably archaic form of government, but also our entire political system, including city council districts and elections. So why is this happening right now? Every decade, there is something that's called a charter review commission that is paneled and appointed by city leaders. Portland's charter is essentially our operating manual for running the city. It's our sort of founding document, and it details and outlines essentially how the city works, both in terms of its government and its election system as well. Once a decade, this charter commission comes together to examine Portland's founding document, make potential tweaks and recommendations and propose changes to that charter. And then if they are big enough proposed changes, uh, those come to voters to decide at the ballot box. And this year in particular is uh, th this charter commission that began in early 2021, they were appointed in December of 2020, mm -hmm. are deciding to go big and bold and they are looking at and have just recommended a series of changes that would completely transform our form of government, expand uh, the size of our city council, and also completely transform local elections here. Before we get into all the, the nitty gritty proposals, that's a big task to be on a committee that that is, uh, you know, taking a hard look at at the operating manual for a city, which is a, a big city, you know, one of the you know top 30 largest cities in the country. Who's on this body? You said they're appointed by the council, but can you give a, you know, obviously you don't have to name every member, Shane, but uh, give a sense of who, who uh, who's on that, that uh, commission, because it's, I mean, it's an important role. Yeah, so this is a citizen led commission. Uh, the, the members of the commission were appointed by the mayor and members of the city council back in 2020. So actually different crop of city council members than we have today, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a 20 person body. And uh, in this case, this is, I was going to say arguably, but definitively sort of the most diverse commission in Portland's history. It spans a, an array of individuals with different professional backgrounds, life mm -hmm. experience, you know, civic involvement. And more than half of the members on this commission identify as a person of color or indigenous. And, uh, and again, uh, just compared to sort of commissions past, this is just a very diverse array of individuals. Okay. And before we get into some of the recommendations uh, that you reported on, how unique is our form of government for the uninitiated and what makes it unique? <laughs> well, uh, if, if somebody's listening to this right now, they probably already have the feeling or sensation that uh, Portland city government is not working very well <laughs> at the moment. And many people 
uh, sort of a, a growing chorus of individuals from many backgrounds and walks of life, both residents and people who are involved in the political process, are saying that Portland's form of government, which at this point in time for a large American city is entirely unique, that wasn't always the case, but our form of government is like no other in the country currently. And a lot of people are making the claim and argument right now that it is not serving the city particularly well. So what is uh, so different about Portland's form of government? Mm -hmm. It is a commission form of government. And this means that our mayor and city council members, uh, and there are only five people in elected office in Portland, and that includes the mayor, all five members are not only serving as legislators and policymakers, but they are also running the city's vast bureaucracy. So commissioners are given various agencies by the mayor to essentially run, whether or not they have any management or executive experience or are even familiar with some of the agencies that they run. The reason why we have this form of government to begin with, it was a decision made over 100 years ago. We switched to a commission form of government in 1913. And arguably at the time, it made sense for a smaller city. Um, I mean, Portland has grown by a factor of, I want to say, close to four mm -hmm. in that time period, maybe, maybe like three, three and a half, something like that. We can, uh, you can look that up, <laughs> but, uh, but, but all, yeah, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a state, substantially larger city, but also at, you know, at the time, the idea with having the elected leaders of the city also overseeing and running the bureaucracy, it was a way to sort of root out municipal corruption, which was widespread, both in Portland and other American cities at that time. However, we've gotten to this place in our city's history where Portland's much larger, and so are the problems uh, and issues that are confronting the city. And there is a, 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 a belief among folks that this commission form of government, at a time when we are trying to meaningfully address things from uh, a surging number of shootings and homicides to a crippling homelessness crisis to making uh, meaningful action on environmental issues and climate change, that having this commission form of government, which essentially silos the bureaucracy and sort of divvies it up among five different individuals, just isn't getting the job done or is making the job substantially harder for city leaders. And it's not just that, right? They're also making land use decisions on, on top of the policymaking and the, the management of these various uh, city bureaus as well, right? Correct. So, and, and again, uh, j just for, for listeners to imagine this, when you elect a member of your city council, they are not only tasked with coming up with new laws, policies, and legislation, Ostensibly, they're also supposed to be responsive to constituents, which can be a bit of a challenge Sure. Uh, because, first of all, all of our members of city council and the mayor currently run citywide. They're not elected by a geographic district. And uh, often the question is, well, who do I contact for issue X, Y, and Z? Constituent services, which is kind of the bread and butter for most local elected office holders, is just something that this form of government uh, is bad at delivering, but also running things. They're, work, they're, they're also being asked to be city administrators. And it, again, that's just um, arguably a lot for such a small body of people. Yeah, talk about multitasking. And um, up until uh, Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, right, there, there was no commissioner was uh, was elected who lived east of 82nd Avenue. Right. The, you know, the other issue that we've run into with our form of government and how we have this at large, i.e. folks run citywide, is traditionally uh, it has been sort of an inequitable system of government in terms of its representation. I mean, we have had, uh, you know, women and people of color serve on the Portland City Council historically, 
but uh, not in great numbers. I mean, as recently as 2008, I think, as I pointed out in one of my recent stories, mm-hmm. as of two, in 2008, the Portland City Council ha- was all male and all white. And, uh, you know, historically, the elected leaders of our city have come from predominantly affluent neighborhoods, you know, up until relatively recently, uh, mostly west of the Willamette River. Now, that has changed substantially despite the system of government and how it works, mm-hmm. uh, you know, voters have course corrected uh, in that respect. I mean, currently we have, again, five members on the city council. We have uh, three people of color, including two women. Joanne Hardesty is the first black woman to serve on the Portland city council in the city's history. And, uh, and we also have a stronger uh, geographic representation of council members living in East Portland. And then also say East of uh, 39th or Cesar Chavez, which again, historically has been very rare. Okay. Let's take a quick break. Then we'll come back and talk about some of these specific recommendations with Shane Dixon Cavanaugh. Shane covers Portland city hall for the Oregonian and Oregon life. Okay, Shane, so let's dive into some of the specific recommendations. What does this commission come up with? What are they uh, proposing? I know it's not a done deal yet, but uh, what what are the options that they're looking at in terms of ways to um, completely change our form of government? Well, again, as I mentioned, these are currently proposals. They're not a done deal, but the Charter Commission has issued a set of recommendations for their proposed changes to Portland's city government. And we're going to have to break these up into three sort of discrete units. And I'm assuming right now that some version of each of these three will make the ballot for November, or at least let's just uh, assume that's going to happen. Of course, um, something could (laughs) uh, uh, occur where that, where where that's not the case, but uh, And voters are not going to be asked to approve or vote down all three of these changes together, but they should probably come out in three sort of separate amendments that folks will get to vote on. Now, uh, I also just want to say that for the uh, Charter Commission, they are sort of seeing this as a comprehensive package where all three of these pieces kind of fit together. However, there is a very real possibility that folks could decide to. Uh, a majority of folks could decide to vote for one or two and not the third or one and shoot down two. But so anyway, um, that's, that's not confusing long... at all. No, uh, it gets, a, it gets a little confusing, but so, <laughs> the, so the, th- so let's break down the three proposals. Yeah. One is transforming that commission form of government. One is focused on the size of the city council and district representation and how that would work. And the third is our actual sort of election system. And I'm just going to get into all three of these and give a quick and dirty sort of overview. Sounds perfect. On on form of government, the, the commission has recommended scrapping our commission form of government and moving to sort of a more traditional form of government model. In this case, uh, uh, members of the city council would be elected by geographic district the mayor would run citywide. He would be, or he or she, or they would be the only person uh, mm-hmm. in elected office to be elected by uh, the, the entire city. Now, the city council members would no longer have uh, a role in running the bureaucracy. That would over, be overseen by the mayor, uh, and they would have a, a city administrator or city manager who is essentially seeing. Uh, and and uh, being being held accountable for the performance of various agencies and bureaus, and that is a fairly common um, form of government in other American cities. It's sort of a hybrid between what is uh, traditionally called a strong mayor system mm-hmm. or a city manager system. So, like for instance, in this case, uh, the city administrator uh, would be. Essentially, uh, the rec- would be recommended by the mayor, but the city council would have to approve that person. The mayor does not get veto power in terms of city council votes on, under this proposal. The city administrator uh, can be fired by the uh, city council if three quarters of the council members vote to do so, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay. So, so that's um, so that's kind of the proposal that the uh, Charter Commission has made for form of government. Their second proposal would be to increase the size of the city council to 12 members. However, it's not as simple as creating 12 geographic districts uh, that these council members would represent. What they are proposing is something called multi-member districts. And so essentially how this would work is there would be four geographic districts created in the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. And from each of those districts, there would be three elected representatives. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there'd be 12 city council members plus the mayor making it 13? Correct. Okay. I'm I'm following. Okay. <laughs> you still okay. got me. Oh, yeah. But, but so uh, multi-member districts, and we can get into this a little more if you'd like later yeah. on, but multi-member districts exist in some states, in state legislatures, like mm-hmm. Arizona and Maryland, for instance, have a sort of multi-member district system for electing uh, representatives to, uh, in the state legislature. However, uh, there are there are not any current major American cities that have this kind of district representation. So it is fairly innovative and it's fairly rare. But there, uh, that was the recommendation that the commission came up with in terms of their uh, of how to sort of create uh, more council members and districts. Okay. What are the arguments for and against that? I, I guess before we get to the third, um, you know, the third uh, proposal, just uh, lay that out for us because it, well, it does sound unique. Yeah, well, so the so the the the, the commission has uh, one of their sort of guiding principles here uh, with their recommendations is that they were looking for ways they believed would be able to. Uh, ensure a uh, greater diversity of civic participation in city government, and that includes elected representation and, uh, as well, uh, so boosting diversity and the level of engagement. And they believe that since just given the sort of uh, demographic, uh, racial and ethnic, and socioeconomic distribution uh, or the way in which those um, demographics are distributed across the city, mm-hmm. the, the best way to sort of ensure or try uh, to closely guarantee that there is a diverse body of representatives would be to uh, have these multi-member districts. And so they believe that we'll have more uh, people of color, people with different socioeconomic backgrounds and other sort of, uh, you know, you know, other factors that, you know, would make them a more diverse body. Are there any arguments against having this type of system? Well, yeah, and we're going to get into that as we sort of move further along in the process. But I mean, first and foremost, it is, uh, it's relatively unique. Uh, It's not widely known. It's uh, in as far as like American systems of government and representation go, it doesn't occur in many places. And so far, and I'm planning to look into this a little bit more, the, uh, you know, the only other city in the last 20 years that has had a multi-member district council system in the U.S. was the city of Baltimore. Mm. And their charter uh, uh, commission back 20 years ago in 2002 looked into eliminating the multi-member district system because they b- found and believed it wasn't serving the city well and voters agreed and they eliminated their multi-member district system um, back in 2002. And I haven't had a chance to look into that in great detail at this time, but I plan to do so um, a little later on as I continue reporting on this. And I think the other sort of issue too, in addition to it being sort of a little bit confusing or strange or different, there's also this issue of constituent services and geographic representation. So right, like at the beginning of our conversation, we were having this issue of, well, Portlanders have an elected representative. Who do they call if they have an issue or problem? So currently they can call one of five, uh, the mayor and four members of the city council. Uh, Under this uh, four district, three member, multi-member district system, you essentially would have three representatives uh, that uh, you would want to contact if you have an issue. And also, I think there's the, the, there's the question of whether or not 
uh, a large uh, geographic district. While it's not the entire city, it's a quarter of the city. And so will each of these elected representatives from those areas uh, really be closely in touch with each of the neighborhoods in Portland and the particular issues affecting those neighborhoods, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you might have three people who are representing like North Portland and Northeast Portland, and that could be St. John's and it could be all the way out to, you know, Grant Park or something. And I mean, further than that, I yeah. mean, if you're, if you're cutting up the city into quarters, yeah, yeah. let's, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of territory, a lot yeah, of different so neighborhoods. You, you would, you would have uh, conceivably a city council member that would be a representative for the St. John's neighborhood all the way to Coley or even further east. Yeah. Um, and so clearly the, uh, the, the the makeup of those neighborhoods and sort of the needs of those neighborhoods are vastly different. And so it will be incumbent on these representatives uh, in each of these large districts to really sort of understand um, the, the, the sort of needs and demands of a very um, diverse set of communities. All right, Shane. So what's the uh, third, um, I guess, the third bucket of. of yeah, yeah, changes? I know this, this is a, this is a lot to sort of unpack in, uh, in a, in a short period of time. So hopefully this hasn't been uh, too rambling and long winded. Oh, I love it. This is, this is my jam. I love this stuff. Well, it might be your jam. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's your uh, listeners jam as well. And if it isn't folks, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better. <laughs> but so, and so the third one is related to elections and the, 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 the proposal here, uh, once again, is to do something that is becoming uh, more common in cities and states in the U.S., but is still uh, only used by relatively few. And uh, essentially, we would be eliminating primary elections in Portland for local races, for mayor, city council, and auditors races. So there would no longer be a May primary. There would only be one election per cycle in November. And the type of voting that we would do is not a traditional vote for one candidate and uh, the person with 50% plus one or more wins. Uh, but we would be switching to what's called a ranked choice voting system where voters get to choose or sort of rank their preference of candidates. Uh, and then based on how individual candidates are cumulatively scored or ranked by voters would determine uh, the sort of winner or winners in these races. Hmm. So instead of uh, uh, Mayor Wheeler and Sarah and our own going to a runoff, um, you know, Mayor Wheeler would have, would have won in that uh, instance in the mayoral race. Potentially. I mean, it really depends. Remember that, uh, not to get too in the weeds here, but in 2020, in that primary alone, I mean, there were m many more candidates than just Ted Wheeler and Sarah Iannarone. And depending on uh, how various candidates were sort of ranked, mm -hmm. um, there could be very different sw swings in terms of who would have emerged as the winner in, the, in that kind of scenario. Okay. Well, we just went through a, a ton of stuff here, Shane, but um, kind of taking a step back, I know it's it's still April and November is a long ways away, but do, do you have a sense of, is, is there going to be any organized opposition to this or, um, you know, because voters have turned this down eight times, right? Um, changing, not this specific proposal, but changing Portland's form of government. Um, I know we're in a different era now, but do you have any sense of whether there's going to be an organized opposition against this? Or is this kind of, you know, things are going to happen. It's just a matter of what those things will be. That's a very good question. So before I answer that, just to sort of outline what the process is going forward, and mm -hmm. then we'll try to do this uh, succinctly. But so these are uh, recommendations currently, and the next step is for the city attorney's office to draft up proposed uh, amendment language for the ballot for each of these three recommendations. So, uh, you know, and ballot measures, as you're aware, uh, are, are kind of tricky. Like they are hard. Uh, it's a challenge to write them in a way where they pass the sort of uh, legal requirements to actually mm -hmm. make the ballot. So the city attorney's office has its work cut out for them because they have to now uh, sort of craft 
ballot language for each of these proposed recommendations that can actually uh, become amendments. And that will require uh, potentially some further tweaks and modifications. And the Charter Commission plans to hold a number of public hearings in May so that more folks can participate and give their feedback to these proposals. Um, so uh, there, there could be further changes along the way. Uh, depending on how things sort of shake out, these recommendations could turn into proposed amendments that go directly to voters, or uh, there's a potential that the city council would be asked to uh, work on them and make the ultimate decision of which ones go before voters. So all of that stuff is pretty tricky and complicated. But then to your point, uh, will there be opposition to one or all of these proposals. I think people have been, uh, especially folks who have questions or concerns about some of these recommendations, most have, there hasn't been real strong opposition at this time. I think folks have been waiting to see what the recommendations were and are waiting to see what the amendments actually look like before we're going to have a more sort of um, intensive discussion around the the merits of each mm -hmm. of these individual recommendations. I would say that, and, uh, and this is reflected in some of the reporting that I've done already and just what I've seen in terms of reviewing some of the public comment and testimony that has been presented to the commission um, in recent months, which is the, the change to the form of government um, seems to have widespread support uh, and people, uh, you know, across the spectrum seem to, to be convinced that that is a uh, very good and obvious decision to make. When we get into multi-member districts and ranked choice voting, some initial polling that has been out suggests that voters are open to those ideas or, uh, or, or you know, and are likely to potentially support them. But there really are still a lot of questions that I think need to be answered. And I think the other sort of question that I am pondering or thinking about is in the context of what is the electorate going to be looking like this year? And is, are they going to be, are they going to have the appetite for something that is very bold in innovative, like multi-member districts and ranked choice voting, that's to be determined. Well, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, lots a lot of stuff in the air, but I guess it's it's feasible that we have some powerful business lobby or other you know union group or what have you running a campaign that's uh, yes on sixty three and sixty four, no on sixty five. <laughs> you know, a combination of the of uh something like that i mean it could get it could get complex um which i guess is just par for the course on this stuff absolutely well anything else we didn't cover i don't even know where to begin andrew <laughs> this is very technical stuff it's it's pretty wonky it is an extremely sort of detailed and involved process from start to finish so um, i hope we at least whetted listeners appetites and I would encourage them to read some of the previous coverage that we've done on uh, the charter reform efforts this year. And also just to um, the Charter Commission has uh, a website with a ton of information, uh, progress reports, detailed reports, minutes from their meetings, and uh, and also just sort of the public comment that people have offered at this time. And for those who are interested and inclined and have the time, it, it, it's going to be worth looking into um, or looking at some of that stuff. But also, I'm going to be covering this um, extensively in the weeks and months ahead. Actually, just a couple more that just popped to mind. So in the past, you know, there have been folks inside uh, city government who have opposed these changes, but that's not the case today, right? Uh, from from the elected members, more or less. Yeah, I mean, most uh, members of the city council right now, uh, currently serving in office, have said that this form of government does not work. Uh, it is harmful and not helpful 
to addressing many of the issues that Portland is facing right now, and that they are encouraged by the work that the commission is doing thus far. So yes, but I, I nobody, it, even yesterday, I was watching and covering the city club debate between Commissioner Dan Ryan and his uh, main challenger, A.J. McCreary. Mm-hmm. And both of them were asked about that, some of the questions with the charter reform recommendations, and both indicated that they were very much in favor of some of the ideas and concept. But again, uh, fully baked proposals and recommendations are not ready yet. Yeah. So I think that will really depend on what these things finally look like for, but, but, but everybody has expressed an openness to these types of changes, especially in terms of scrapping the commission form of government. And that has not always been the case. And and then lastly, Shane, I mean, the question of who stands to benefit, you know, if these changes are in place, I think you, when you talked about the demographics of the, charter commission, I think that might point to kind of what the original intent here, right? Is that, you know, that there are people in this city, um, people of color, marginalized communities who have not been represented or who have not had their interests represented inside city government. Is that kind of the the overall quick answer to the, the who stands to benefit here? Or, or is it broader than that? I would say that is the sort of intent and sort of driving philosophy behind the these recommendations of course uh once uh, you know if they pass and if they are put into place we will actually see whether or not those assumptions pan out and uh you know but that is certainly the the, the intent uh of the of of the commission and that's been sort of their desire and kind of uh you know north star guiding set of principles well, political consultancies and political interest groups will also benefit because there'll be more people who need to run for office and do these proposals. So uh, that's another factor, I guess. But I think we'll end it there. <laughs> Shane, thanks for all your reporting on this and for explaining it. I appreciate it. Thank you again, Andrew. Thanks for listening to Beat Check with the Oregonian. I shared links to some of Shane's coverage on the charter reform issue in the episode notes. If you like this show, give us a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find the show. And tell a friend. Help spread the word. The best way to support our journalism is through a subscription to Oregon Live. You can do that at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Until next time.